So, uh, big question. Hopefully we can get to uh, closer to the answer. So, uh, does anybody want to pray for the word tonight? Does anybody feel led? Anybody? Thanks. Thanks. Sure. God, we uh, just uh, thank you uh, so much for who you are and uh, how consistent you've been, God, in our lives and um, the ways in which you've uh, just uh, been so awesome and made ways. Uh, God, we just pray tonight uh, as we are unfolding your word, God, that you just uh, let us down to the deep treasures of your heart so that we can see, um, God, just in, in clarity what uh, what it is that we need to get out of this lesson, um, God, that, that insight that we need tonight uh, to draw us closer to you. Uh, we just uh, pray over the word right now. God, let it be saturated in your anointing, God, and just, uh, God, speak through Todd. Um, and anything that's... Uh, not like you just move it out of the mm -hmm. way. Just God, yeah. you just shine through. You just yeah. shine through everything he says, every uh, every word that comes out of his mouth. God, mm -hmm. let it just be completely and totally bathed in your anointing um, that we might uh, be enriched, that we might be encouraged tonight. Um, we bless you and we ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. <coughs> yeah, I pray that things that are not true fall on deaf ears and things that are true plant seeds within your soul and like ignite you to action and love and peace. That's so true. Thank you for saying that. That's always my prayer too. When I when I teach, or when other people teach, like if it's if it's not of you, if it's not of you, God, like just I, I'm sorry. I'm human, reading with human eyes, doing the best I can to communicate the most beautiful being ever. I'm not. You are. I'm the conduit. I'm the medium. I'll do my best. I will fail, and even tonight I will fail. But God is amazing and works in our weaknesses yeah. we'll hit on that tonight for sure so uh, so we're looking at mark we're asking mark gospel of mark 200 year, 2000 years ago you know um so and he, he begins his gospel so this is we we think we believe that this was the first gospel ever written okay so it's really cool um will someone read the first passage and what i'm going to ask you to do when it's read out loud is what words uh, kind of uh, come into your mind? So if anybody wants to read, just mark 1-1. One, one. It's just that first line. If anybody wants to read it out loud. Sure. Thank you, Jill. Mark 1-1, one, one, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A that's, voice of one calling. That's oh, good. Sorry. Just no, it's super. It's super simple. <laughs> it was too short. I was Mark talking. one one, and I'll read it again so you guys hear a different translation. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. I'll read it one more time, but and just what words just like pop out to you? Just don't don't read right now. Don't read. Just listen. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Okay, is there a phrase? Is there a word? What what jumps out to you? Beginning. 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 Yeah. The Messiah. Son of God. Son of God. About. About. It's about Jesus. It's about all what I'm about to say. Son of God, beginning. The Messiah. How about the gospel? The gospel. Some say the good news. Like these, Mark, the, the, the Holy Spirit inspires Mark, right? To write about what, what happened with Jesus. What I'm about to tell you the most dramatic event of all of history. The most magnificent point in history. We kind of know like when God touched earth, like I'm about to write that. Every word that I'm about to write, I'm going to be precise. So I think if we look at the very beginning of Mark, we should handle it with like weight and respect and reverence. And so he says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Beginning of the gospel. <coughs> Messiah, the Son of God. He is telling us what he's about to write about. So we're going to, I think if we want to know who Jesus is, we have to figure out what the beginning of the gospel, the Messiah, and the Son of God. And that's where we're going tonight. We're going to figure out in order to know what, who Jesus is, we have to find out those three things. So, my question to you is, 
Let's start with the first one, gospel. What does gospel mean? The good news. Has anybody ever come to you with like this question, I have good news and bad news? What, is, what does that do to you? Like, hey, like Isaac, like, just, okay, I've got good news and bad news. What do you want to hear first? Like what? What is it? I don't know. What does it do? Which one do you pick first? Right? Do you have a default, like, uh, bad news because good news is going to make you feel better, like a roller coaster, like, yeah. I don't want to end on a bad note? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, when someone presents that, it's like, what? And when someone presents that to you, the news cons- is going to affect you. Yeah. It's never like, just so you know, this is a matter of fact, whatever, like, uh, Charlie got new shoes. Oh, that doesn't affect me. I don't know Charlie even. I don't even know who Charlie is. No. When someone comes to you and says, hey, I have good news and I have bad news, what do you want to hear first? You know, like, I was, I, was, I was just driving to work. You called me and you asked me this question. I have to stop. Maybe it's intense. I don't know. But I'm vulnerable right now. Because what you're about to say, I know it. It's going to affect my day. No one does that unless they have a word for you. Yeah. This is what I love about Mark. He starts off like this. Hey, I have good news. And in our culture, when someone says that, it affects you. And when the first hearers were hearing that, they were hearing that too. Hey, what you're, this is the first line. Whatever you're about to read, like the next 16 chapters, it affects you. And guess what? It's good news. And now, now gospel, it means good news. What did gospel mean? We're going to go back in time, 2,000 years. What did the gospel mean to the first hearers? Here's what the gospel, when they heard gospel when someone came to them the word gospel was a weighted message whenever there was a new emperor when he took over the Roman Empire or a a new king came in charge before the message of the dead emperor went out to say like hey here's bad news like the, the dead emperor you know he's passed away and this and that no the new emperor what he would do is he would have messengers and he would send them with the message of the gospel that he is in charge. And they would, these messengers would be holding this weighted message and they would go to the provinces, the cities, the towns, and the villages. And they would go in the middle and they would say, gospel, here I have a gospel. We have a new king and he is in charge. And people around this time, they knew that when they heard this, just like when we hear this too, that it's not something we just like, you know, think about and keep driving and whatnot. No, but it was something that was going to dramatically affect them. It's not like a new president like shifts, you know, in our, in our current context, like, okay, George Bush and then Obama, like our lives don't really change or this or that. But when someone like a gospel, there's a new king, like his domain, his, his rule is going to affect you. All across the Roman Empire, they knew that there's a moment of vulnerability. I don't know if this is good or bad. You say it, yeah, Roman messenger. You say this is good news, but me, I live in a corner in Galilee, and you keep taxing me. Is this guy going to tax me even more? Because he can, because he has Roman soldiers all around my village, and my family's tired. And you're saying gospel? And this is the word Mark uses. Mark starts off, gospel. So, if that's what the Romans, how, how they use the word, how is Mark using the word? Gospel. We have a new emperor. We have a new king. What's his name? Jesus. Kind of like Mark, he's so precise. He uses powerful words. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus. He's king. We have a new emperor. So, so far what we know, who is Jesus? He's good news. And he's he's new in charge. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a story that's going to describe how God is in charge now. How Jesus is in charge. That's that's interesting. Okay. All right, next word. What is the next word? Messiah. Christ. Okay, so what's Jesus' name? Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. I know I grew up thinking, I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, that's his last name. No, that is his title. 
I remember when I found that out, I was like, what? Oh, someone should say that, that it's not his last name. <laughs> but okay, I, look, I know that now. I know that it's not just his last name, but it's his title. Christ and Messiah are the same words. They're ba- they're, they mean the same thing. And, uh, and to answer this question, what does Mark mean by Messiah? Uh, what does Messiah mean? We're going to go to Mark again. And does anybody want to read again now? Uh, eight? Just one verse. Yeah, yeah, just one verse. Or just keep reading. Um, it's, it's Mark 8, 27, 33. And I have extra papers, just so you guys know if anybody wants to use one. Um, but yeah, I'll just drop this one down. Here. In case. Okay. So 8, 27 through 33. Here's my read. Yeah, good. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. Sir. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked, who do people say I am? They reply, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others still one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do, I, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, this, this is the longest passage we're going to read, but it's so, so important because it communicates so many things about who Jesus is. And then actually, it's a perfect passage because the very question we're asking tonight, Jesus puts on them. So Jesus and his disciples, he has, a, he has a gang of disciples that are just following him, and they're walking from village to village, right, carrying out his ministry, healing people, announcing the kingdom. And Jesus, it's like he's walking, and then he stops. Who do they say I am? Who do other people say that I am? And they, they blurt out, John the Baptist, he just died. Uh, you're John the Baptist, somehow resurrected, I don't know. You're Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of the old. Another one answers, you're one of the ancient prophets. They just start saying these things, like, that's who you are. You're just like them, or you are them somehow, but we don't know how to fuse it in our mind and connect and, and uh, make it come sense. But that's who we think you are. And so they start saying these out, like, that's... That's who they think you are. And then Jesus stops. Who do you say I am? That question tonight. Who is Jesus? We're trying to answer that. And Peter, he hears that. He's like, you're the Messiah. And, and Jesus, after that, he simply, he goes into, this is what the Messiah is. He says, son of man. It's, it's a word that, that definitely means Messiah. It's the same role, same title, same position. And so he goes on and tells Peter and disciples, the Messiah He's going to be rejected. He's going to suffer a lot. He's going to be rejected by the elders, uh, the, the priests, the teachers of the law. And so the religious authorities of our world, all the Jews, all the best preachers, all the best pastors, everyone that you hold dear, like they're going to reject me. And then I'm going to die. And then we'll, I'll raise again on the third day. And, what is, and you, have the, you have it right there. What, is, what does Peter do after he just called him Messiah? He brings him aside. He, it says he brings him aside. And he rebukes Jesus. That's hilarious. That's funny. Like, Jesus, look. No. I know what you just thought you said about the Messiah. You're wrong. And Jesus stops him and says, get behind me, Satan. And then rebukes, rebukes Peter. By the way, it's probably never a good idea to rebuke Jesus or God. I'm just like, I know maybe we do in our prayer life sometimes, but he's always right. But Jesus says, you don't have the mind of God. You don't have the mind of God. Now, this, this might seem a little strange, but this, this passage, this story has more weight behind it when we understand where Peter and the rest of the Jews are coming from. Peter grew up as a Jew in Israel, oppressed by the Roman Empire. Roman soldiers would be around his city and other nearby cities. 
And he would sit down with his family and have dinner each night. And his father would bless the food, thank God, but then apologize probably to his family. Sorry there's not that, as much food as I wish there was. But you see, Caesar keeps taxing me. I keep working and I could have had enough food for us, but I'm oppressed. The Roman soldiers, the Roman Empire taking our money, our time. We don't live autonomously. We're not... We're foreigners in our own land. We're oppressed people. And I'm tired of it. And then he would go in and he would tell Peter, Peter, like, don't, just so you know, there was a time, like a thousand years ago, when, when the Israelites, us, your people, when we were just, we were ruled by God alone, a theocracy, where God would speak to the judges and then we would carry out his will. But then we wanted a king. And so we got a king, but a King David and King Solomon, times were good because we weren't oppressed by someone else. We weren't oppressed by the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Greeks or the Roman Empire. We got to make our own mistakes on our own. And the money we made, we got to give to our families. We weren't oppressed. And I'm tired of it. But Peter, don't worry. His father would probably tell him, don't worry. God tells us in his word, that there's going to come a time when there's the Messiah, the Christ. He's going to come, Peter. And all this trouble, being oppressed, being enslaved, being a foreigner in your own land is going to go away because the Messiah is going to come, Peter. He's going to come and he's going to wage war on Rome. He's going to, he's not going to, he's going to wage war on the enemy, the tyrant, the Pharaoh, like he did in the Exodus. And he's going to defeat him. And Peter, once that happens... He's going to set up his own kingdom, the kingdom of God. And where it's just going to be like the time in Judges. We're going to be Israelites under the authority of God, and we're going to obey his law. And we're going to live like that. But we can't right now, but we've got to wait for the Messiah to come. We've got to wait for him to attack the enemy, whether it's the Babylonians, the Assyrians, or the Romans. And when that comes, it's going to be good. We're going to be saved, we're going to be delivered, and we're going to be redeemed and it's going to be good. And so, so, you see, in the first century, Jews, they ex this is what they expected of the Messiah. They expected the Messiah to come and fight against the tyrant of the time, whoever the Pharaoh of the day was, to wage war on him, defeat him, and then establish the kingdom of God, where a time where God w alone would reign, and it would last forever. And so here, now, now all of that, so here's Peter, He's like, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. I've seen you walk on water, calm storms. Actually, you know, I've seen you deliver people from demons. You've fed 5,000 twice, like with just a couple of loaves of bread. I've seen you do miracles that I just can't even fathom. Like, you're, you're beyond me. You're the Christ. You can easily take over the, the enemy, the tyrant, the Pharaoh. Like, you can easily do this, Jesus. And Jesus says, yes, I'm the Messiah. And I'm going to suffer. And they're going to reject me. And I'm going to die a painful death. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. Here's, here's Peter's box of God. And Jesus responds. Jesus takes Peter's box and stomps on it. God is bigger than that. Yeah. Has, God ever, has, God, has God ever just shown you more of him? And you're like, that's how loving you are? Or that's how beautiful you are? That's how, well, I didn't know you were like that. This is like Peter's entire life just blown up. So, of course, he has his dreams and hopes in, in Jesus' hands, and he doesn't like it, and he rebukes Jesus. Of course he would. But you see, Peter didn't have the mind of God. He didn't have what God had in mind on how to redeem Israel, on how to redeem the world. You see, Jesus wanted to show Peter that what the true Messiah was supposed to do. The true Messiah was going to come and suffer and defeat the enemy. He was going to do, he's going to defeat the tyrant, and he did. He dealt him a lethal blow. See, because Peter was right just in part. He was going to wage war. He was going, he, but Peter was wrong on how the Messiah would fight. He was wrong on who the tyrant was. See, Jesus came, and he, he didn't wage war against his earthly enemies, but he died for his earthly enemies. 
And he didn't wage war against the Roman Empire. He said, that's just an arrow of the true enemy. Do you know who the true enemy is? It's Satan. The kingdom of this world is ruled by Satan. And the principalities and powers. See, I've come not to defeat simply a symptom of evil, the Roman Empire. I came to address evil. Yeah. And Peter didn't see that. He thought he was just like, he was just like, no, you got to take away the Roman Empire. No, I have to attack the root of the problem. And he's so much more beautiful than, than we thought. He's so much more powerful than we thought. Jesus, the Christ, attacked evil at the root, at the cross. So the beginning of the gospel, Jesus is king, and he's the Messiah, not the warrior Messiah that kills his enemies, but dies for them in order to defeat evil. And he's just constantly pushing our boxes or jumping outside and says, I don't even know that box that you have that you set me in. All right, so the beginning of the gospel about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. This is my favorite title. The Son of God. It's the last one that we're addressing tonight. And uh, I'm excited about it. So again, in order to understand what the Son of God means, we have to go back down into the books, in the books of history. So the Roman Empire, there was a huge, huge civil war in the first century. Just before the time of Jesus. Between Octavian and Mark Anthony. Has anybody seen the, the show Rome? That's an HBO show? It basically like covers this. Rome, Rome was in a civil war that was consuming the entire nation. There was social unrest, chaos. Just It was an ungoverned em empire. Because Octavian and Mark Anthony, who were governing it, were fighting over it. And everybody knew. And everybody was waiting. When is this battle going to end? Because it's just chaos and unrest. And Octavian wins the battle. Octavian wins. He defeats and kills Mark Anthony. And right afterwards, Octavian claims the names, we know him as Caesar Augustus. He takes Caesar from his, his uncle, Julius Caesar, and he names himself Augustus. Augustus means the one who is divine. He names himself the one who is divine. He takes on God. He was also worshipped as Son of God. Can you believe the first hearers, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, Son of God? That's a slap in Rome's face. That's like, he's not the Son of God, but we'll get there. So Caesar, Augustus, the one who was divine, called himself the Son of God, and he was worshipped. See, everyone knew this storyline. This was a clear storyline. Caesar Augustus, the son of God, he waged war against Mark Anthony in order to, and fight and kill him in order to bring peace to the entire world. Religion, violence, peace for the entire world. And then in the corner of the Roman Empire, while that was going on, after that's just finished, we have Jesus born in a, just a nothing sort of town, Galilee. I don't think we would ever hear of Galilee. If, if it wasn't for Jesus. So he's born. And he has this ministry of extraordinary signs and wonders. I've already touched on a little bit of them today. He, would, he walked on water. I mean, he literally controls the weather. There was a storm that was about to kill um, very skilled fishermen, and he says, stop. I mean, it's with, with one word. Yeah, he's, he's healing droves of people, exercising demons out of people. He's giving sight to the blind. He raised a little girl from the dead. Like, powerful things. But those things are probably not the most profound, provocative thing in Mark. And this is so key where I'm, where I'm going right now. This is so cool. In all of Mark, there's not one human that recognizes Jesus. There's not one human that recognizes Jesus as who he truly is. He was doing so many things. But guess what? Heaven and the demons knew who he was. I have on here, Mark 1, 14 through 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee. No, that's not it. 
Jesus, uh, Mark 1, 23 through 24. Mm -hmm. Just then, this is the beginning of the story. A man in, the sy in their synagogue was possessed by an evil spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. <laughs> a demon knows exactly who he is. And then another one, we know this as the man that was possessed by thousands of demons. He was called Legion. He ran and he saw Jesus from a distance. He ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? In God's name, do not torture me. Demons all know who he is. Demons all know who Jesus is and how powerful he is. And then this cloud, we know as, that it's God. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. All throughout Mark, people are witnessing Jesus perform extraordinary acts. We've listed them. And the response that people give are awe, fear, gratitude, and more consumption nature. I want more. You just fed us 5,000 loaves. I want, let's keep following you. Give us more food. And, and then, but no one still noticed him. Only the demons, not one human. And up until the very end, a centurion who sat at the foot of the cross saw how he died and said, truly, this is the Son of God. Camp there. Do you know how profound that is? It's a Roman centurion who probably just worshipped in a Roman little religious temple. Augustus is the Son of God. Augustus is the Son of God. You know, he's defeated Rome. He fought and he killed and he ruined and he's so powerful. He's used force to dominate the Roman Empire and bring peace. And then later on that afternoon, he was, he was told to crucify this man. And he saw such a profound depth of love. <coughs> a man that sacrificed himself for all of humanity. In weakness, he cried out. It says he saw how he died. Jesus cried out. And he said, that's the Son of God. That's power. You see, the true king is not the one that dominates by force, but the true king is Jesus who gives his life and sacrifice in love. See, the Son of God, Jesus is constantly reshaping us, disrupting us. I thought the Messiah was like this. I thought this was what the gospel meant. I thought the Son of God is like this. True Godlike power is when you love someone, when you love people, and you don't force upon them, but you display love that's, that's weak, and you come under and you serve people. See, God wanted to establish the kingdom, and in order to do so, He died for all of us. Um, I, uh, I love Jesus, and and I'm still learning more and more about him, learning what it means, what he did, and how important it is for us today, and how beautiful he is, and, and uh, what it calls us to do. But I know, like, this life and this ministry and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, he calls to us to imitate. The Messiah, who doesn't conquer by force, but conquers by service. On the cross, he didn't display, display Caesar-like power, who dominates and defeats his foes, but he displayed true godlike power where he dies for his foes. He gives his life for his enemies and friends, family. That's what true godlike power. And we are called to imitate that. Even in law, we are called to spread the gospel. Just like someone, just like someone in the early times when Emperor Octavian became the new ruler, and he sent out messengers like, the gospel, you have to hear the gospel. Augustus Caesar, he is the emperor now. We are called to go out into Lowell and share the gospel. Do you know God is reigning now? God is in charge. He set up his kingdom. And, we're, and we advance the kingdom how Jesus started the kingdom. By delivering by reconciliation, 
peace, love, and hope. And he's given us hope by His example, by His sacrifice, by His demonstration. So we're called to do the same just in our neighborhoods. Um, uh, do you, is, that's, a, that's a lot of teaching for tonight. Um, and thank you for, for listening. Um, next week, uh, we have Tim. He's going to be teaching us some, some more Jesus, some more beautiful things. I love getting into Jesus. Like the more, I mean, it, I mean if God, God came to earth and manifested himself in one person, of course it's going to be the most beautiful thing that has ever existed. And so we can't get enough of him. He's a cornerstone of our faith. And so this month, we're just going to get a lot of Jesus. So that way when Christmas comes and his birthday that we celebrate, we know who we're celebrating. <laughs> and we know how to celebrate him. Yeah, it's good talk. You know? And so that's why this month is Jesus month <laughs> at All Ramps. It's Jesus month. And, uh, and Tim is going to teach on what did Jesus do and why. And he's going to go off on that. And then Kim, she has a third Tuesday. And she's going to say, why pledge your allegiance? Why follow Jesus? There's so many other examples out there. There's so many different faiths, or they're this or that, or it's too hard. Why follow him? These are important questions. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah. it's, it's fun to wrestle with. And I thank you for giving, me, for giving me your audience because I thoroughly enjoyed studying this question. Mm -hmm. My roommates know they're like, I, don't, I have to relearn Jesus almost. I have to go back and, and relearn who he is. And uh, I'm, he's still teaching me new things because cause he's a living God. Yeah. That's what the beautiful thing is. He's a living God. Yeah. yeah, he's not dead just in a grave. He rose again, and he's up there at the right hand of God, and he sent us his spirit, and he's continually working. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be changed by renewing of your mind. So we're going to constantly mm -hmm. learn new things and be drawn closer to God mm -hmm. revealed in Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, are there any questions? I don't know if there's any questions. Like, you just want to throw up, throw, throw up in the air, like, and we're probably not going to be able to answer them. But we do have Phil here, so we'll probably be able to answer them. Uh, you know? Uh, <laughs> no pressure, Phil. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the question I was asking myself, Todd, and many other folks will have questions like this, is... Um, Right, so first of all, thank you because I feel like you are, you're helping me to, to walk right back into the question that, that, that you're asking us tonight and uh, in some new ways, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. So I think what I was thinking was uh, a couple of things. One is uh, that, so, so Jesus represents himself as, and, and as you said, the demons recognize, and others ultimately recognize that he is the true Son of God. So there are others out there perpetrating themselves as the Son of God, Caesar Augustus and others, right? Mm -hmm. But he's the real deal, mm -hmm. right? So you can, you can say that you're Todd Dildine, but, but you're the real deal, mm -hmm. right? You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, you know, I don't care who you say you are, I got my ID, you stole my identification, I got that, but, but I'm the real deal. All right, so, so Jesus is the real deal. And, and the fascinating thing to me about what you shared tonight, and Jesus talks about it here with Peter, he talks about how the he says, what does he say? He says the he says I'm the, I'm the Messiah. He says the Son of Man. And I just again, like I'm like, okay, so here's this image of of rich and powerful, and I show everybody my power because. And the way I do that is I, is I force things upon you and I demand things of you and you have no choice but to say yes to me. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's Caesar Augustus, right? Like, that's not yeah. taxing you, man. Man, I, I don't care what you think. Give me $50. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, now. You know what I mean? So they, that's, that's how Caesar Augustus shows his power. And Jesus goes, I'm the real deal. I'm, I'm the real son of God. And then he goes... And he says, his first words are, and the real deal, to demonstrate his power, has to suffer many things, has to be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law, that he must be killed 
after three days and then rise again. Like that's like so backwards to me. And so I just um, but then I was I was reminded, right, so I'm reminded of this of this scripture, right? So we wrestled not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers. Right, absolutely, rulers in high places. And so I'm like, you're right, Todd. Jesus knows that Caesar Augustus, he's just sort of the Oh, it's like the Wizard of Oz. It's like uh, he's like he's like the voice, you know. Caesar Augustus is the voice, but like the real dude deals behind the screen. You know what I'm saying? Like I know, so I can mess with Caesar Augustus, but I'm going after the real enemy. Yeah. And so the only way to like defeat the the real enemy is to take the real enemy's biggest blow and defeat that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like. It's like, all right, so I'm the real deal, and I'm not worried so much about Caesar Augustus. I'm worried after Satan. I'm worried about Satan. So I'm going to take the thing that Satan has his most powerful weapon, which is death. I'm going to take it, right? Because otherwise, how it's like, oh, for me, I'm like, uh, so I was watching the for a sports guy, right? Like I'm watching the the, the Seahawks game last night with it against the Saints. And Seahawks are at home, and they're dom they just dominated the Saints last night. 37-7. Killed them. And, uh, but to me, and I'm like, so, so next week, the 49ers, my team, has to play the Seahawks. But we play them in, in, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of glad, because I'm afraid if we go to Seattle, we're going to get smashed. But in San Francisco, we have a chance, I think. So, but here's my thing. But if San Francisco really wants to be, like, the best, mm -hmm. then we've got to beat Seattle in Seattle. You know what I'm saying? So it's sort of like, give me your best, and then if I beat your best, then you know I'm, then you know I'm it. You know what I'm saying? So it's like Jesus is like, I'm going after Satan because he's the real deal, and and Satan's gonna give me death because that's the best he's got, and then I'm gonna beat death. Mm. As a poet, which is so crazy, because he's like, you should go after Caesar Augustus. You know what I'm saying? Most yeah. of us would be like, man, go after Caesar. You know what I'm saying? Destroy yeah. his army, like. You go sit on his throne. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's your seat right there. You know, and Jesus is like, no, no, no. The real son of man, I'm going to suffer. Mm -hmm. I'll be rejected. I'm going to die. Why? Because Satan's going to give me the best he has, which is death. And then I'm going to defeat that. Because there will be nothing else mm -hmm. that anyone can ever do. So then, so all these other scriptures sort of flood me, right? It's all like, right. you know, all these other scriptures are about, right? Uh, if God be for me, who you know, who can be against me, right? Because because right, because it's like it's right. He's yeah. right. Yeah. There is no one who can be against you, right? Because he because he defeated Satan, who was far, who was the most, he was the greatest adversary, and he took on Satan's worst blow, and then he beat that. Mm -hmm. So I just those are all the stuff's going through my head as I'm listening to you talk about this, man. Yeah, my head's messed up. So. No, no, I I love that analogy of uh, Seattle. Because, <laughs> no, I do, because I'm a Fortnite fan, and I read your post last night, and I don't like uh, Pete Carroll, too. Right. Because he's in Seattle. Yeah. Right. And yeah, I think it just, it's powerful. I mean, we talk about the who Jesus is. Um, Bill was already hitting on it. It's just, and it just brings to mind, like he said, so many scriptures you think about, you know, even from the very beginning of Jesus' gospel, where he's in the wilderness for 40 days. Mm -hmm. Nice. And, comes out and he's tempted, right? Right. So, I mean, powerful. I mean, how hungry would you be after 40 days? Yeah. Know, it's it's and we're teaching on this uh, coming up some, yeah. some point uh, in February. Future, right? In February you're doing yeah. it? Yeah. Like About the temptation. February, March. March. How, how hungry do you have to be, right? And yeah. then you get these three powerful, mm. I mean, they're yeah. like, and the, the impact to those, right, each all speak to the who-ness of who he is. Yeah. Right, um, and I think what I, I love about answering that question and trying to find as we're digging through this, like getting through the to the answer of that is the the one thing that was well, was foundational is the consistency yeah. that Jesus displayed mm -hmm. throughout his walk um, here on on earth with us. The consistency of his character and who yeah. he was and still is, uh, and I think. Um, it's it's definitely something to pay attention to yeah. for us as we follow is that he was consistent yeah. and that it was the exact opposite 
right, of yeah. what we would attribute to a king or a ruler or a messiah, right? I mean, the the earthly mentality of that, like you said, is about force and like, oh yeah, you need to come and take. Yeah. But what it, I mean, and it's it's taking me back to the Fresno Pacific, the upside down kingdom. I mean, it's yeah, a complete right, right. flip yeah. of what you would, <coughs> what we would consider to be a display of power. But yeah. um, I think it speaks volumes to to who he is, and who he yeah. is in our lives. So. I think Jimmy Hendrix said it pretty well. Uh, the world, I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but the world will know peace when the love of power is overcome by the power of love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's a poet, yeah. an <laughs> artist. It's good. It's good. He may have stole it from someone else, but he's known for saying that. It's good. Yeah. This stuff fires me up because I think that uh, for me, like I just, you remind me, man, who Jesus is. I'm just like, I'm like, uh, man, I'm like, I'm like, so he takes on, he takes on evil's greatest blow it's like the it's like the the atom bomb you know like it's it's the biggest thing it's the nuclear weapon right it is it's everything that evil has to offer jesus takes it on and defeats it right mm -hmm. and then i'm just like and then i am i'm, I'm just i'm i'm just sitting with these words about you know uh you know more, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, yeah. right? I mean, you know, like you know, if God be for us, who can be against us? Yeah. If, that if that, that with man it is not possible, with God all things are possible, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all these scriptures just flood me, right? And I'm like, like man, I know. And so for me, I'm thinking about the neighborhood. I'm thinking about my life. I'm thinking about my family. I'm thinking about all the stuff in my life that's just not where I want to see it. And I'm like. Like man, like but there's like there's nothing that God can't do. He took on evil's greatest blow and he beat that. Yeah. And so I'm like, so what? So I mean, he beat that. So I'm just like, there's nothing that evil can possibly throw at us, that Satan can possibly throw at us, that that Jesus cannot and has not already defeated. Mm. And so I'm just like, man, sickness. You feel sick? You know what I'm saying? And you're just like, what up? Like, let's, you yeah. know, like, God, where, you know, let's go. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, there's yeah. violence yeah. in the neighborhood. I don't care. Let's go. Like, yeah. you know, God's got yeah. that. You know what I mean? Whatever it is. Yeah. So that's why I appreciate people like who, like in, in the church, other folks who walk in like healing ministry and stuff, because they remind me. You walk in healing ministry, you remind me that God is, is, is greater. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I'm just like, I love that. And I just, so for me, I just, this is so powerful because I'm just reminded that there's absolutely nothing. That, and so I think that sometimes, sometimes we, we, we call Jesus the Son of God, but I think we act like Satan's the Son of God. Mm. Wow. You know what I mean? Because we think that, that Satan's greatest blow is the greatest blow. Mm -hmm. And we keep forgetting that Jesus actually is victorious over Satan's greatest blow. So we say Jesus is Lord, we say he's Son of God, but I think we behave like Satan is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think that's just like a, such a helpful sort of reminder for me and a challenge for me like mm -hmm. step up you know what I mean yeah. like like where's your faith you know what I'm saying like so I just this is this is really rich for me does anybody have any questions like if you were to ask a question and normally you may not be shy but you know, like I have this question like, is there any questions out there because it's, it's a question week about Jesus Maybe not. I don't have a question, but um, and it's hard. My voice is like going out, but just um, a comment, I guess. Just feeling encouraged and reminded, kind of like uh, what Phil was saying, just like the awe of Jesus and knowing how powerful He is. And I just think, like on a practical level, I'm reminded like how He overcame evil with good with love mm. and yeah. how Peter and I appreciate that background history about yeah. where um, the time was when Jesus walked the earth and his coming and everything because that helped me to understand like Peter's perspective on the situation because we do think like oh we want God to fight our battles this way yeah. or just how we respond to different trials and tribulations it's like 
um, we can't be carnal minded. It's like a reminder that our weapons are not, you know, carnal. It's not of this earth. It's um, just to be reminded that, <laughs> excuse me, to be reminded that though God overcame Satan with just that love and just by uh, <clears throat> defeating his enemy. But, well, I know you said like the, um, not the way that Caesar would have. It was a different way by actually taking on those burdens, taking on everything, you know, all those, the weight of the world basically, and just being reminded like we cannot um, just get weary in our good doing. Mm -hmm. um, prayer is important, it is powerful, and just having faith and just walking in that, like those are our weapons, and to really just continue to walk in that, because that is what's going to overcome, because sometimes we want to retaliate in a certain way, yeah. you know, thinking carnal minded, mm -hmm. yeah. so just that's, kind of take us back. That's good. That is a good point. You know, I mean, yeah. Peter's, Peter's first idea of what Jesus or was supposed to be isn't so different than ours. Especially if we want to conquer Lowell neighborhood and someone, we might just want to conquer it and just in, like use force against people. Like, God, just move out these bad people. Move out these colonizers. You know, move out these bad people. Yeah. But no, God's like, no, I want you to believe for them. Sacrifice. Push them. Give them hope by your example. And it's tough. And we might be just like Peter, like, no, Jesus, that's wrong. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Wait, no, that doesn't work because I just said the other thing. But, yeah, we're, uh, we're called Jesus' example. Janelle, did you have a... I don't know. I kind of do, kind of not. Um, this is really timely for me. I was reading in Acts um, 4 last night, and Peter's talking there, too, but it's a completely different Peter mm -hmm. in Acts 4, a champion in Christ, than the Peter that we read about in Mark and um, just his boldness in declaring the power of just the name of Jesus. Yeah. Like I've been stuck on just the power of the name of Jesus yeah. all day and all day last night just trying to understand just how powerful his name is and what that signifies. And so this is really good. It's, it's mind blowing. I don't know. How do you not love Jesus? It's just like incredible. <laughs> if there aren't any further questions or comments, just close us in prayer. And uh, does anybody want to pray? Anybody want to close us in prayer? Oh, I'll do. Dear God, thank you so much for uh, revealing yourself in Jesus and giving us uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for the example of your Son. Thank for the wisdom that you share with us through your word. Lord, I pray that uh, anything that was beneficial, anything that was of you, I pray takes root and grows inside us. And it moves us to action. But not just like, oh, that was a fun fact, Dad. But Dad, may you move us to action. May you move us to imitate you. May we bear your image well. Father, help us love one another. Help us love you. Draw us closer to you. And uh, I pray special blessings over the children's ministry and their development as little image bearers. I pray peace over Lowell, and I pray, Father, that you use us to advance your kingdom. And it's in your son's name that we all pray and agree. Amen. Amen.